Romans 6 will be our text for today. I praise God for the opportunity to preach God's Word verse by verse, expositionally, exegetically, explaining uh, the intent of what God has revealed to us. Romans chapter 6, I've titled uh, this sermon, Baptism into Jesus Christ. Again, I've titled today's sermon, Baptism into uh, Jesus Christ. Today's sermon is primarily going to be focused on verse 1 through 3. Like I do on all the rest of my other sermons, I try to read the, the whole chapter because there are certain texts in Romans chapter 6 I'm going to allude to or cite directly in today's sermon. So if you would please read along with me as I officially begin, by God's grace, the sermon into Romans chapter 6. Follow along with me. God's word says in Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, Ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Final verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. God Almighty, today we endeavor to learn about the baptism into Christ Jesus. 
Lord, many today have grossly perverted the topic of baptism and have added to the completed and saving work of Christ. Lord, today, I pray that the, the message will refute those heresies and explain exactly why baptism into Christ Jesus is a symbolic expression that points to an inward reality of what God has already done in the heart of the believer. I pray that you will bless this time we have. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon us. I pray for um, eyes to see and ears to hear this truth. I pray for hearts uh, to be, uh, old hearts to be extracted and, and new hearts to be given uh, through the preaching of your word in accordance with thy will. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today's sermon, I'm gonna focus on verse one through three of this important chapter. And I've titled again today's sermon, Baptism into Christ Jesus. Before we address verse one, when the apostles said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? It's important that we briefly look at the ending of Romans chapter four to find out why Paul asked this question in verse six. I mean, verse one of chapter six. At the latter part of Romans chapter five, the previous chapter, the apostle Paul said, for when the law entered that the offense might abound and where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. For sin reigned unto death, but grace hath reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by the Lord Jesus Christ. So because the ending of Romans chapter five mentions that sin abounded, but grace did much more abound. Now in verse one, we see why Paul asked this question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No, Paul's not asking this question because he doesn't know the response. The reason why Paul is asking this question is to help Christians think critically about the implications of bad doctrine. Clearly, when Paul asked this question, it would be like me asking you all, what good is your free will if the Bible says no one comes to me unless the Father who, who sent me draws him? Now, that doesn't mean I believe in free will. I believe free will is a myth. The point is just to get you to think critically about why you need to stay far away from bad doctrine. So again, when Paul asked the question, what should we say then? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Paul asked this question because there are people today that do have an antinomian mindset. Or there are some today who think that you can live a profligate lifestyle or that you can live in a manner that is reckless and imprudent without any consequences. Now, if you don't know what antinomianism means, let me explain. If you have the word antinomianism, or typically it's just anti-nomos. Anti means against, and nomos basically means law. So it's anti-law. Historically, antinomian is somebody who rejects the third use of the law. But moreover, I would argue that most true antinomians will argue that the moral law or the Ten Commandments were abrogated. And therefore, they're going to argue that the New Testament doesn't teach the Ten Commandments. It's an Old Testament doctrine. Problem with that view is the fact that the Apostle Paul taught on the Ten Commandments. So did Christ. It's mentioned all throughout the New Testament. So how can it be abrogated? For example, in uh, Ephesians, didn't the Apostle Paul say, children, obey your parents? That's one of the Ten Commandments. So how can the moral law or the Ten Commandments be abrogated if it was clearly and undeniably taught in the New Testament? When people argue that the Ten Commandments were abrogated and they no longer exist in the New Testament, I'm like, okay, so you're saying that you have a license to commit idolatry and blasphemy and 
you can kill, commit adultery, steal, bear, bear false witness, and covet, and you have a license to do all those things? What do you mean the law is abrogated? The law is a reflection of God's nature. The law cannot be abrogated because God cannot be abrogated. So that's why it's important to tell people that. Nonetheless, I always tell people, don't be confused by what I'm saying. The law cannot save. The law cannot provide assurance of salvation. In believers, God's elect, the ones that have been declared righteous, are not under the law. They are under grace. It's important you have to understand that. So when Romans 6 verse 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Again, the reason why that question was asked, because previously the text says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Again, so now that we have that covered, Paul responded with a beautiful statement in verse 2. God forbid, God forbid, Paul said. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer therein? That was Paul's response to verse 1. Again, I want to draw your attention to verse 2 because Paul said, God forbid. How can we who have died to sin live any longer into it? When the Bible says died to sin, that does not mean that believers stop sinning as the sinless perfectionists will typically argue. Now, if you don't know what a sinless perfectionist is, I'll explain to you very briefly. Sinless perfectionists, if you really want to see what they espouse and what they're heralding, just look no farther than some of the street preachers you're going to find on the internet. A lot of them will tell people that when you become born again, that you stop sinning or that you cease from iniquity. Now, the problem with those arguments is the fact that it's a direct contradicting, contradiction with the Bible. Read 1 John 1, 8. It literally says, if we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. And guess what? The author of that text was writing to believers. Therefore, the notion of sinless perfectionism is heresy. So what does it mean when Paul said in verse 2, how shall we who have died to sin live any longer there? And what does that mean being dead to sin? Well, I'll try to provide a quick commentary on it, and it's rather easy. It simply means that Christ has redeemed his particular people from the power of sin. And it means those who have literally been declared righteous know that the death has no dominion over them. That is literally why in Romans chapter 6, the Bible says Jesus being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no dominion over him. That's what it means when the apostle is writing about being dead to sin. It doesn't mean you stop sinning. Don't be confused about that. Additionally, Here's one of the most beautiful aspects of what it means to have died to sin. You have to read, go back a few chapters earlier. In Romans chapter four, do you remember when the apostle said, blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Do you remember that text? Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. This text is a, a important text to appeal to, to, to make the argument of how believers have died to sin. Now here's what's unique in the English text that says, will not impute sin. But if you look at the Greek New Testament, the Bible actually uses a double negative. So it doesn't state, will not impute sin. It says, will never ever impute sin. But let me provide exegesis on this or provide commentary on this text in Romans 4 because it ties in a lot with this text I'm reading right now in Romans chapter 6 verse 2. Again, going back to Romans 4 where it says, blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. 
The author used the double negative. In Greek, it's the word u and then mi. U, mi. Never, ever. Now, I looked at Thayer's lexicon, and Thayer's lexicon defines those that double negative as, listen to this, not at all, in no wise, and by no means. That's what the double negative is literally referred to as. Not at all, in no wise, by no means. But here's what's unique about that text in Romans 4, where it says, blessed is man whom the Lord will never, ever, and then he uses the word impute. Impute is in the subjunctive mood. Now, if you don't know what subjunctive mood means, it means a mood of probability or possibility. So when you combine it all together, when he says, will not impute sin, literally, you can interpret that text to mean, based on Thayer's argument and based upon the subjunctive mood, you can literally interpret Romans 4, that text, as followed. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will, not at all, in no wise, by no means, no possibility or potentiality, impute sin. Isn't that beautiful, guys? That is a beautiful way of looking at the text. This is popularly known today by scholars as emphatic negation. Another ex text you can see this emphatic negation in is also in another prominent text in Hebrews 13. I believe it's Hebrews 13, 5, where it says, let your conversations be without covetousness and be grateful for what you have or be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Now, in that text, again, you got the double negative followed by the, the aorist. Never, ever forsake, never, ever leave. Never, never leave and never, ever forsake. But again, you have to follow that same grammatical guidance that I gave you earlier. So literally the text reads that I will not at all, in no wise, by no means, no potentiality, no possibility, leave you. And I will not at all, in no wise, by no means, no potentiality, no possibility, forsake you. You see how God's promises are clearly expressed in the word of God and why the Bible is very clear that you have to rightfully divide the word and explain the, the, the meaning that God has intended us for us to learn. That's why it's critical. So the reason why this is also critical, guys, when you're going back to verse one and two, now let me explain this, this is important. In verse one and two, Paul says of Romans chapter six, what shall we say then? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. How shall we, having died to sin, live any longer therein? Paul is using what's called a question answer approach. Clearly he starts out in verse one with the question. And then in verse two, he explains or provides the response. Now here's what's unique. This is typical of Paul's writings. If you carefully follow Paul's writings and pay careful attention to detail to his style, you'll notice that this is very specific in Paul's writings. It's not uncommon. For example, in Romans 6, verse 1 through 2, you have a question, answer, and then he also says, God forbid. God forbid. How should we, being dead, to, die to sin, live any longer therein? He does the same thing in Romans chapter 3. Same thing. Let me give you an example. At the very beginning of Romans chapter 3, he literally says, what advantage does the Jew have? What profit is there of circumcision? That's the question. And he responds by saying, much in every way for it has been given unto them the oracles of God. Paul then asks the question. He says, what about some who didn't believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Paul then responds and says, God forbid. See, there's the God forbid part. He says, let God be true and every man a liar. Paul then asks the question again. He says, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say then? Is God unrighteous for seeketh vengeance? And then Paul responds with a question. And remember, previously he said, I speak as a man. Paul then responds by saying, God forbid, for how can God then judge the world? 
So again, when you're reading verse 1 through 2 of Romans chapter 6, with the question and answer, and then with the reference of God forbid, this is Paul's unique style of writing. Helping believers to think critically about the implications of bad doctrine. Now, what I want to do since I've concluded teaching on verse 1 through 2, and the final verse that I'm going to teach on today, I'm going to spend a great deal of time in this. This next verse is to now address verse 3 of Romans chapter 6. The apostle says, Know ye not that many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized unto his death. Now, this text right here has led to many debates, not just with Baptists and Presbyterians, but also with Christians and men today who believe in a popular heresy called baptismal regeneration. Now, this text is critical because let me tell you this really quickly here. There are some men today in the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, or the Church of Christ denominations that will argue that water baptism is necessary or effectual for salvation. That is a popular view today called baptismal regeneration. So when they read Romans 6, 3, where it says that many of us were baptized into Jesus, they're going to argue that baptism is required in order to be into Jesus. That's what they're going to argue. And they're going to argue that's why you have to be immersed in water or sprinkled over your head, and that guarantees you salvation. That is the popular argument held today by false teachers. It's a false gospel. And I'll explain several reasons why in today's sermon. So again, when you're reading Romans chapter 6, verse 2, please understand. All throughout the Bible, God's prophets, God's apostles, God's teachers, they proclaim biblical redemption, not baptismal regen regeneration. So people today who believe in baptismal regeneration are not affirming a holy ritual. They're embracing rank heresy. It's important you understand that. Now, clearly in Romans chapter 6, when Paul talked about baptism into Jesus Christ, they were baptized also unto his death. Paul did not have baptismal regeneration in mind. And I can tell you why. First of all, look at the immediate context of Romans chapter 6. Do you realize that baptism is only mentioned twice in this whole chapter, and he doesn't mention it again. He mentions it in verse 3 and verse 4, and that's it. And don't you think if baptismal regeneration were true, that God would have sent Paul to baptize? <laughs> but he didn't. You know what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1? Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul said, For I baptized the household of Stephanus, and I don't know any other households that I've done that to, but he says, God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. Again, notice how the apostle said, for God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Additionally, what I want to draw your attention to now is the exegesis of a particular word. There's a preposition that's used in this chapter where it says into, baptized into Christ Jesus. Many people debate this preposition a lot. Now, I was reading a, a scholar by the name of A.T. Robertson, and he was pointing out that he would prefer to say baptized in Christ Jesus or baptized unto Christ Jesus, and he didn't appear to like into very much because he, he argued that that implies that union with Christ was brought to pass because of the means of baptism. And he said that's clearly not Paul's thought because he's not a sacramentarian. Nonetheless, the 
scholar that I mentioned earlier, A.T. Robertson, also argued that that baptism is a public proclamation of one's spiritual relation to Christ before the baptism occurred. Now, that's important that you guys understand that. So when I define baptism, I always say that baptism is an outward expression of what God has done inwardly in the heart of his people. It signifies or it's a symbolic expression. Now, some people don't like that. There are some people that argue, well, no, we don't. There's no such thing as a symbolic expression. That's nonsense. Oh, what I argue is their argument can easily be refuted then. Because look at the context of Romans chapter 6. They argue that there's no symbolic language in Romans chapter 6. Well, just look at the context. Take a look at verse 6 with me, please, of Romans chapter 6. Look what it says. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Knowing how he, Notice how he says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Clearly, that's symbolic language. Can any, of you here to, can any of you here today say that you were literally hanging on the cross next to Jesus 2,000 years ago? Of course not. Because the context is referring to the fact that Christ died for his elect and he rose again for their justification. That is why the author of Romans points out that we are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's the context. So clearly the symbolic reference is there. Okay, I was reading, I think it was Beisner who pointed out that clearly there's a precedent for it here based on the, verse 6. Additionally, here's a great example of a symbolic expression of baptism that we clearly see in the Bible. You guys know how the New Testament mentions Noah, how it says that God did not spare the world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, and brought the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now think about what a lot of those things signified in the days of Noah. I want you to think critically about this, okay? So pay careful attention to detail. Back in those days of Noah, the only way to escape the torrential rains and the the judgment of God upon the earth was to get into the ark. So the ark was a type of Christ because it was salvation from the flood. The waters signified judgment and wrath and condemnation. Now, when the waters eventually abated and the ark rested on the mountain and Noah and his family and the animals were able to come out, to see the so-called new heavens and the new earth, that signified a type of resurrection. So let me put it to you from this way. When Noah was in the ark and those waters beat upon the ark and it raised it up, that signified being immersed. That signified death and burial. But as the ark brought them safely through the waters and subsequently the waters abated, the ark rested on the mountain, and eventually they came out. That signified the resurrection. So again, Noah's experience in the ark was a type of baptism, signifying their union with Christ or their identification in his death, burial, and resurrection. Similarly, what do you think takes place in baptism in the church? Why do you think you take somebody and you immerse them in the water? Because that signifies death and burial. And when they come up out of the water, that signifies they're resurrected. Again, it's a sim it's a outward expression of what has already taken place inwardly. Okay, this is important you understand. So now what I want to do is provide a definition for baptism. Now I argue that baptism is a New Testament ordinance, not sacrament. There's nothing saving about water baptism. So it's a New Testament ordinance ordained by Jesus Christ. So let me tell you what takes place. 
the Holy Ghost spiritually circumcises the heart of God's elect. They're saved. Subsequently, a believer by faith, which is a gift and a work of God, they profess an outward proclamation of what God has already done inwardly inside their hearts. Again, it's about their union with Christ and their identification in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, I didn't come up with this following illustration, but I've heard many scholars argue that baptism is similar in a sense to a wedding ring. Now, a wedding ring doesn't legitimize a marriage. It merely symbolizes the love a man and a woman have for each other before the marriage takes place. Similarly, baptism symbolizes um, basically what has already taken place in the heart of a believer. Again, this is important that, that I explain this to you because you have to be able to define your terms when people ask. Moreover, anytime you talk about the discussion of baptism, we never can forget what the Bible tells us about the distinctions of baptism. Now, let me make this clear very quickly, because this is important. In Ephesians 4, do you remember how the Bible says there was one Lord, one faith, and one baptism? Now, that's a beautiful text. Now, because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, simply put, in this church, we don't believe in three gods. That's polytheism. We believe in one true God, and this one true God is multipersonal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Since we believe in one God, therefore there's only one baptism. And the one baptism is particularly the Holy Ghost regenerating the elect or spiritually circumcising the elect. As a result, God's people, when they are saved and they profess faith in the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, then they will be baptized as a public proclamation of what has already taken place in their hearts. Now, because of what I just said, some people will argue, well, you're contradicting yourself. The heretics are going to argue. The Bible says there's one baptism, but you just talked about two. And again, they're, what they're doing is they're failing to realize, oh, no, 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 no. I agree with exactly what Ephesians 4 says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I affirm that text. Undeniably, unequivocally, unashamedly, I believe that text. And I also have to recognize that the Bible provides context for the word baptism. The problem with heretics is they ignore context. I don't. Now, let me share with you context for how baptism is used in the Bible, because I don't want you to be confused, brethren. Trust me when I tell you. Romans 6, 3 says... That know ye not that many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were also baptized unto his death. You're going to run into people that will try to argue that that's a text that proves that if you're not baptized, then you have no union with Christ. So they're going to try and tell you, you got to come to our church so we can baptize you, so you, you can be saved. And if you leave us, then you lost your salvation. That's today what the heretics will teach. So let me provide context for you on how you have to examine baptism. Let me throw a few examples at you. In Matthew chapter 3, do you remember a, a notable text? And I guarantee most of you have heard it before. In Matthew chapter 3, do you remember when it said, I will baptize you with, the, with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me, I am not even worthy to tie the sandals upon his feet. And... He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Do you remember that text? It's in Matthew 3. Well, I want you to notice how there's three references of baptism in there. Notice clearly the context speaks for itself. John's baptism symbolized repentance. Do you know how I know? It says it right there in the text. I baptize water unto repentance. So clearly... The baptism of John symbolized repentance. Another way we know that is, again, based on the context of Matthew chapter 3. Do you know in Matthew chapter 3, <coughs> John the Baptist proclaimed, bear fruits worthy of repentance? And do you also know that when John was baptizing, 
in the water, people were confessing their sins. So again, John baptized water unto repentance. The people were confessing their sins. And he says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And let's not forget Mark 1. Mark 1, it also mentions the baptism of John. And it talks about repentance. So clearly, the baptism of John symbolized repentance. Next, when in Matthew 3, when it says, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Or when you are baptized with the Holy Ghost. What do you think that signifies? It signifies the washing of regeneration or regeneration of the heart. Let me give you an example. In Titus chapter 3, it says, Not by the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Next, what do you think it means when it says the Holy Spirit and with fire? What do you think the reference of fire means? What's the baptism of fire signify? Well, again, the Bible speaks for itself. You just have to examine the context of Matthew chapter 3. The subsequent verse literally says, with a winnowing fan in his hand, he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather up wheat for the barn and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So it signifies judgment. So again, that's why I argue context must determine how baptism is interpreted. False teachers are so enamored with teaching that water baptism cleanses a person's soul, which is heresy, that they miss the context of how baptism is interpreted. Additionally, heretics will also argue that, well, baptism only has one meaning, and it's salvific, and it's what regenerates a person's soul. Well, clearly, they miss the context of Matthew 3 then, because do you guys know that Jesus was also baptized in Matthew chapter 3? Jesus didn't need to be saved. Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus made it clear why he was baptized, to fulfill all righteousness. Additionally, look how baptism is used in Matthew 28, where it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In that context, the Bible's not teaching to sprinkle water over someone's head or to immerse them in the water to save them? They're talking about the baptism of believers. That's what the text is referring to. Now, some people are going to disagree with me, typically Presbyterians. They're going to disagree with me. They're going to say, oh, no, 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 no. They're going to say that text refers to the baptism of babies. So when I challenge them, okay, how does Matthew 28 teach babies to baptize? Because they're going to say, well, baptized all the babies in the nation. <laughs> well, no newsflash. Babies isn't mentioned in Matthew 28 in that context. Second of all, they're going to say, well, the nations. No, because here's the exegetical piece that they miss. In Matthew 28, when it says baptizing them, them is a pronoun. And guess what? It is in the masculine. Nations in Greek is the word ethne. And that word is neutered. So the antecedent of them cannot be nations because they don't agree in gender. That violates the pronoun antecedent agreement. So what is them referring to? Or who is them referring to? Them is masculine. Guess what that's referring to? In the context of Matthew 28, you got to go back a few verses. It's referring to disciples. I believe disciples, that word is mentioned in Matthew 28, 16. And guess what disciples is? It's masculine. And so is them. Baptize them. He's referring to disciples. Now, to further the argument against the Presbyterians, a baby is not a disciple, ladies and gentlemen. It's foolish to make that argument. I'll tell you why. The Bible gives the best definition of a disciple. If you read John 8. Read John 8, verse 30 through 32. Jesus talked about those that believe, those that continue in the word, and those that know the truth. And he says, these are my disciples. So that's the best definition I've ever seen for a disciple from the Bible itself. Now, if somebody can show me evidence of a baby today that can believe, that can continue in the word, and that knows the truth, show me evidence of that, and I'll consider retracting my statement. 
But as far as I'm concerned, I'm a man. I stand by my word. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. Because clearly the context is referring to matured believers. It's referring to somebody that is following Christ, not a baby. So again, the context of Matthew 28 is referring to the baptism of believers. Additionally, I want to draw your attention to the reference of baptism in Mark 10. In the latter part of Mark 10, remember when the Savior said, For you will indeed drink from the cup that I drink from, and with the baptism that I have been baptized with, ye shall be baptized. What do you think that signifies? Do you think Jesus was talking about baptismal regeneration? No. Jesus was referring to his baptism of suffering. Look at the context of Mark 10. Now that makes sense when you read Romans 6.3, the text in today's sermon. Romans 6.3 again says that you've been baptized into Christ Jesus. We're also baptized unto his death. Baptized into Christ Jesus, we're also baptized unto his death, and it's also his resurrection. So the context, another key text that deals with baptism uh, will have to be in 1 Corinthians 10, the very beginning part of 1 Corinthians 10. Now, in that text, it talks about the Israelites being baptized into Moses. Now, some people argue that, well, the reference of baptism is a precondition in order to be saved, well, you can't use that argument in 1 Corinthians 10 because when it says the Israelites were baptized into Moses, clearly they didn't have to be baptized in order to have Moses be their spiritual guide. He was already their spiritual guide. So the context of 1 Corinthians 10 is literally referring to their identification with Moses or their union with him. It has nothing to do with in order to become. This is why I've long argued with people, context is not on the heretic side. See, here's the problem with the heretics today, guys. It's one of the reasons today why I told you those texts I read earlier, pay careful attention to detail to that symbolic expression of cleanse and wash in those Bible texts that we mentioned earlier. A heretic sees any reference to water and they immediately assume, ah, we can be baptized in a in a, 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 a baptismal tub and we can have our sins washed away. What a foolish notion they have. First of all, you can take a homeless guy off the street. The person could not have taken a bath for months. Their smell could be putrid. You could provide an opportunity for that person to take a, a warm hot shower, shave, provide lots of shampoo and soap and Soak that person in cologne. They may be clean on the outside, but inwardly, they may be the most radical scum and refuse of the world. Okay? So that's why I tell people, don't conflate inward and outward. That's what the heretics will do. So the Bible clearly gives illustrations of cleansing and washing as a symbolic expression of the work of the Holy Spirit done in the heart of a believer. Clearly, the Bible gives reference. What did we read earlier in Ezekiel 36? Now listen to the language again. In Ezekiel 36, what we read earlier. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you of all your filth and all your idols. Do you think the Bible was referring to a hot tub and soap and shampoo? No. The reason why we know that is look at the context. It says, and I will take out your stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. It's talking about inwardly. Another example would be in Psalm 51, another text we read earlier as well. Remember in Psalm 51 when the author said, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity and cleanse me of my sin. Purge me with hyssop that I may be clean. Wash me that I may be whiter than snow. Clearly, the author wasn't complaining that he hadn't taken a bath in 30 days. He said, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity. So again, the reference of water or washing clearly is symbolic of what God does inwardly. 
You have to remember these texts when you are confronted by the heretic. This right here will help you. Another example would be in the Gospel of John chapter 7. Remember when Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He says, whoever believes in me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now the reference of water. The very next example in that context points out that it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so again, context. Another example in John 15. Remember John 15 when the Bible says, Now you are clean through the word which I have declared. Clean through the word which I have declared. Another example in Ephesians 5. The Bible says, Husband, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for her, that it may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water with the word. Notice how sanctify and cleanse. Again, symbolic expressions or examples of what the Holy Spirit does in the hearts of God's people. Ladies and gentlemen, these texts are absolutely critical. Now, what I want to do is really address the heretics. Because it is sure to be before, you're going to find that men in the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, and also the Church of Christ denominations are going to argue that water baptism is necessary or effectual for salvation. I want to address them. Also, it's important to note that Lutherans also hold the baptismal regeneration, but they explain their views a little bit differently than Roman Catholics and Church of Christ heretics. The reason why I say that is because you don't want to take somebody out of context. Just know how they explain their views. You're not going to find most Lutherans today, specifically in the Missouri Synod Lutheran, most are not going to argue that water baptism is necessary or effectual for salvation. I talked to one personally who told me that there's examples in the Old Testament where clearly they weren't baptized and got saved. The Lutherans are typically going to argue that water baptism is, those, water baptism is only one of the means God uses to create faith in the hearts of his people. Nonetheless, that's still heresy because they're still espousing baptismal regeneration. Now, let me tell you why the notion of baptismal regeneration is heresy because, again, the context today of my sermon, I'm preaching on Romans 6, 3. Remember this text about being baptized into Christ Jesus. If you meet a Roman Catholic, a Church of Christ heretic, or a Lutheran, or someone in the Greek Orthodox traditions, they're going to tell you Romans 6, 3 is a proof text for baptismal regeneration. But here's what you're going to have to remind them of. First of all, you're going to have to tell them that the Bible testifies about biblical redemption, not baptismal regeneration. You're going to have to remind them that their views are heresy because they are literally arguing that being immersed in water or having water sprinkled over your head can transform a dead sinner into a delivered saint. These superstitious people literally believe that being baptized can uh, make a child of wrath into a child of the Most High. Again, I argue that those views are elevating baptismal ceremonies above the blood of Christ. I also argue that it's not a holy ritual. It's rank heresy. Because these people could never teach Christ alone. When you proclaim Christ alone, you're testifying that Christ accomplished redemption, justification, propitiation on behalf of the elect, excluding works or law-keeping. Yet, the heretics will argue that water baptism is necessary or effectual for salvation. So they are clearly adding to the completed and saving work of Christ alone. That's why I argue their views today are heresy. I make no apology for that. You guys will find today that in most moderate Calvinist congregations, for some reason, they tend to be very weak and compromising as it, com as it pertains to baptismal regeneration. They want to go back, well, this reformer held to it, or this 
theologian held to baptismal regeneration. We don't believe it's heresy. We believe they affirm justification by faith alone. No, they don't. Trust me when I tell you, no, they don't. If people defend the heretic who affirms baptism or regeneration and argue they do so because they are wolves themselves. What does Jesus warn about in the Gospel of John? Jesus says the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but he says the hireling is the one that sees the wolf coming and flees because he does not care for the sheep. So when somebody starts to defend baptismal regeneration heretics, know that they defend wolves, it's because they are wolves. Additionally, another reason why I despise the notion of baptismal regeneration, again, because it elevates baptismal ceremonies above the blood of Christ. Let me ask you all some personal questions here. Have you guys ever read in the Bible where it says that we're justified by baptism? Never. Does the Bible ever say we're redeemed by baptism? Never. Does the Bible ever say we have peace with God through baptism? Never. Does the Bible ever say that, that we're, our sins are washed by baptism? Never. Let me share with you what does the Bible actually teach. Romans 5.9. It says, much more being now justified by the blood. It doesn't say baptism, it says by the blood. Additionally, Ephesians 1 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Again, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, not baptism. In Colossians 1, it says, and we have peace with God through the blood of his cross. Read Hebrews 9. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through his eternal spirit offered himself up to God without spot to purge your conscience of dead works to serve the living God. Read Hebrews 10. It says, brethren, we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of of Christ. No mention of baptism. Everything is the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Additionally, if you look at 1 Peter 1, it says, knowing that you were redeemed, not with the corruptible things like gold or silver or the vain conversations or the traditions of your father, but by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Additionally, Revelation 1.5, it says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, now to him who loved us and washed our sins in his blood. It doesn't say washed our sins in baptism. It says washed our sins in his blood. So the reason why I mention all this is to point out that the blood of Christ is good news. Baptismal regeneration is bad news. So people who embrace the latter are still deluded sinners and not delivered saints. Lastly, since I'm on the talk of topic of baptism, I want to highlight a little bit more about the proper subjects of baptism. Because again, Romans 6, 3 says that we're baptized into Christ Jesus. We're also baptized unto his death. It's very important to emphasize this, and I'm going to explain to you several reasons why. When you're talking about the proper subjects of baptism, we're talking about who are to be baptized. For example, if let's say hypothetically, we had a large congregation and somebody approached me and they brought a baby in a carriage and says, we'd like you to baptize our baby. Of course I would say no. Because there's not a biblical precedent for that. Now let me explain to you why the Bible does not teach baby baptism. And it doesn't teach baptism or regeneration. The Bible teaches believers baptism. For example, if you go back into Matthew 3. In Matthew 3, do you remember what was stated? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. That's number one. That's a Bible verse, by the way. And it also says that there were 
Christians who were confessing their sins when they were being baptized. So remember this in Matthew 3. Bear fruits worthy of repentance and there were men confessing their sins. Can this be said about a baby? What evidence do we have about a baby bearing fruits worthy of repentance? What evidence do you see of a baby confessing their sins? That's who John was baptizing. Again, clearly, John wasn't baptizing babies. John was baptizing believers. Because only a believer confesses their sins. Only a believer bears fruits worthy of repentance. That can't be said about a baby. Additionally, I want to point something out, a contradiction that Presbyterians have. Most Presbyterians today will hold to what's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, it says that baptism is a New Testament sacrament ordained by Jesus Christ. So I would ask them, where in the New Testament does Jesus ordain the baptism of babies? If that's what your confession says, and many of them hold to a strict subscription to the Westminster Confession, I ask them, your confession states, once again, that baptism is a New Testament, not Old Testament, New Testament sacrament ordained by Christ. I want the evidence for that. Again, some of them are going to go to Matthew 28. Jesus says, baptize them, and the fact that it represents all nations, so all nations, babies are in all nations. But again, remember what I said to you before. Them Again, is masculine. Baptize them is masculine. Nations is neuter. They don't agree in gender. So you have a violation of the pronoun antecedent agreement. As I stated with you earlier, them is referring to disciples. Because the mention of disciples in Matthew 28, 16, and also when he says baptize them, they're both masculine. They both agree. There's perfect unity in that grammatical argument. And remember what I said with you before. Jesus explained what a disciple is in John 8. A disciple is one who believes. The one who continues in the word. And one that knows the truth. Show me evidence of a baby that believes. That continues in the word and that knows the truth. Give me the evidence of that. I would literally like to see a baby today that can show evidence of continuing in the word. Trust me, baby talk doesn't count. We're not charismatics in this church, and we don't believe in that kind of nonsense that uh, a, a baby who uh, speaks gibberish, that that's somehow uh, the gift of tongues, and that's evidence that they believe. No, we don't believe in that. Additionally, I'm going to share with you guys a key text that refutes baptismal regeneration and it also refutes baby baptism. And it supports believers' baptism. And Acts 8. Acts 8, verse 35 through 39 is probably the key text. First of all, let me tell you why Acts 8, 35 through 39. First, I'm going to tell you why it refutes the Presbyterian view of baby baptism. I'm going to share with you why. Okay. First of all, I feel bad for Presbyterians in this sense that I can say with certainty that I don't see any evidence in the New Testament of a baby being baptized. Not one. The Bible never shows that a baby was literally being baptized, and it's so transparent, you can't deny it. But I can say with certainty, I do see examples where there are believers being baptized. A Presbyterian can't say the same. A Presbyterian is going to argue, well, it's a theological argument. We show based on exegesis and necessary inference how babies are being baptized. But they can't show explicit evidence. They're just going off of what they assume is in the text, but it's clearly not there. But they cannot say with certainty that they don't see any examples of believers' baptism. They'd be lying if they did. And I'll tell you why. In Acts 8, 35 through 39, the example of Philip and the eunuch. Notice what took place in Acts 8, 35. Philip preached the gospel. What do you think took place in verse 37 of Acts 8? 
The eunuch professed faith in Christ. What do you think took place in the subsequent verse, verse 38? The eunuch was then baptized. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know in Acts 8, 35 to 39, the text doesn't state that Philip pulled over the baby carriage. You, 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 know what, you know what it says? Look with me in Acts 8, please. Go to Acts 8. I want you guys to actually read this in Acts 8. Acts 8, verse 35, and I'm going to read through verse 39. Acts 8, starting at verse 35, the Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. Notice again first, he preaches. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, if thou believest with thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, notice here, the eunuch professed faith in Christ. Now I'll read verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. This text doesn't state that he commanded the baby carriage to stand still. He commanded the chariot to stand still. The person he baptized clearly was a mature person, not a baby. The person clearly professed faith in Christ, which a baby could not do. And he commanded the carriage to stand still. Not, I'm sorry, he commanded the chariot to stand still, not a baby carriage. So clearly this text refutes baby baptism. And what does it support? Believer's baptism. Because the eunuch believed and then was subsequently baptized, and then rejoiced. Again, notice it was in verse 37 that the eunuch professed faith in Christ. 38, he was baptized. 37 comes before 38. Therefore, again, this text proves believers' baptism. And it definitely does not support the notion of baby baptism. Additionally, let me tell you also how Acts 8 also refutes the heresy of baptismal regeneration. First of all, if baptismal regeneration were true, then that would mean that Philip commanded the chariot to stop so he could baptize the eunuch in order to be saved. <coughs> but that's clearly not what happened now, is it? Nope. The eunuch professed faith before the baptism. The eunuch, the Bible doesn't say that the eunuch was baptized and then was subsequently saved. No, the eunuch professed faith before the baptism. Okay, that right there, ladies and gentlemen, refutes the heresy of baptismal regeneration. So in conclusion, let me just tell you this. Romans 6, 1 through 3. Again, it states, what should we say then? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid, for how should we, having died to sin, live any longer therein? For he says that, for know ye not that many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were also baptized unto his death. Again, the first two verses, that question and answer approach, followed by the God forbid, was simply Paul's way of helping believers to think critically about the implications of bad doctrine. And this is Paul's teaching moment to provide the truth to them. But also, Romans 6.3 does not teach baby baptism. Romans 6.3 does not teach the heresy of baptism or regeneration. Romans 6.3 teaches about the union believers have with Christ. And it refers to their identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Lord willing, next week, I am going to continue on my sermon series in Romans chapter 6. Guess what the next texts are about? Isn't it amazing how I've been going verse by verse through Romans? And the next several verses I'll be teaching on will be on the resurrection. Perfect timing because next week is the resurrection. Looking forward to continuing uh, the sermon series through
the sixth chapter of Romans. I hope you'll join me by God's grace so we can glorify the Lord together and we can embrace the truths that the Lord has given to us. So let's pray. God Almighty, I pray that you were glorified. I pray that the, the, the words uh, will not return void as, as we know they never will. But we also pray, Lord, that thy will be done. We pray that people have heard this word and, and they will embrace it. I pray that it will be edifying to the saints and it will equip them in the ministry to proclaim the truth about biblical baptism and to refute the heresies by men who have been blinded from the truth. I thank you, Lord Jesus. It is in your blessed name we pray. Amen.